All right, welcome back everybody to our next class on empirical methods. For um, just a couple of announcements, um, there were some comments on uh, the Slack channel about more detail, asking for more details on the projects, the project proposals and the final reports, kind of what's expected. Uh, so I will be sending out something written so you can all read this uh, uh, later today, uh, as soon as I get to it, with more details on kind of you know what the deliverables typically look like and some more guidance on this. Um, as before, the advice is come talk to me and or Bobo uh, about your ideas and you know check if whatever you're thinking of makes sense or is in scope or whatever uh, you know before you spend too much time on this. Uh, like informally, talk to us about your ideas. And we can also help you. Uh, you know, with some other ideas, if you don't already have one of your own, uh, that's also totally fine. Uh, okay, the other thing, uh, no, I don't, I don't, I forget. It will come back to me if there's anything. All right, so for today, what I was hoping to do, ah, yes, the other thing, um, Gobo was kind enough to prepare a quiz about research methods uh, and research questions, kind of testing your uh, reading of the uh, assigned reading on formulating research questions. So we'll also be sending that out via Canvas, probably uh, after class. Uh, I haven't had a chance to hit publish on the Canvas thing. Uh, and you'll have, I don't know, as much time as you want, say until the end of the week or so, for a couple of multiple choice questions that will count towards participation. Uh, it should take you no more than you know five minutes to uh, fill this up. Yes. Are you expected to those notes? No, no, no. Whatever you're, whatever I mean, you know, I, I, since you're doing it offline, there's no way for me to enforce it. I just assume that, you know, you will, you know, since it only counts for participation, uh, that you will try to actually, you know, do it, you know, honestly. Um, but you're welcome to look stuff up uh, in the lecture materials. Uh, it's just to encourage you, if, if more encouragement is needed, to actually read the readings uh, because they're uh, often very useful. That's the point of this. Courtney. Uh, um, for the readings on the research question thing, um, I thought the option was like watch the old lecture or do the reading. Yes, that also works. If you uh, instead watch the old lecture, it's totally fine. Uh, you, I'm sure, will be able to answer the quiz by just having watched the previous recording. Yeah, and I was also just wondering, um, is there a way to access, because it's like the textbook, it's like a textbook chapter it looks like. Yeah. Um, is there a way for us to access that textbook online, like a PDF of it or? Um... Yeah, so it's, it, it's if you just Google it, it's freely available, you, you'll find a PDF, but you're right, and I forgot to do this, and thank you for reminding me. I actually have a shared Google Drive folder but not just those, but all of the readings for this class for the entire semester. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will send an email with that too. I'll include that in my email later uh, with sort of pointing you to that shared folder. Uh, so you'll find, I, I, I post all of those there um, and you'll find them there. Uh, some of them are not easily available already, which is why I post them in the shared folder, but otherwise they should all be pretty publicly available. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any, any other questions or logistics or things? Okay, so um, today I wanna to talk about theory. Uh, this, is, this is probably uh, one of the most important things to think about in this class. Uh, and you'll see us coming back, you know, we're gonna focus on theory today, but you'll see us coming back to this idea of theory and its role in empirical research throughout the entire semester. And if, I, if I'm able to kind of plant one idea in your minds for your future empirical research projects uh, or research projects more broadly, uh, is, is this idea of kind of the importance and usefulness of also considering this theoretical uh, lens in your work. So I, I, this is really sort of a very exciting lecture for me or class to talk about, a topic to talk about with you. Um, and yeah, it's, it's today. So what I'd like to do, uh, and kind of a little atypical fashion, um, I'd like us to start 
by discussing the two papers. There were two really interesting, I thought, examples of research papers, none of them in software engineering, um, that use theory in interestingly different ways. Uh, and I wanted us to start by discussing these two papers, and then we're gonna go back and reflect on how they use theory and why and how we might use theory. I'm going to spend the rest of class on, on that reflection. But I want to start with this uh, discussion of these papers. And we had two volunteers. We have two volunteers who were kind enough to uh, offer to present these papers to us just to refresh us uh, today. So maybe we start with, uh, yeah, let's start with the uh, impulse buying paper. Um, and then we do uh, we do the Facebook paper. So now let's see if you can join. Are you on a call? Yeah, I'm on a call. Okay. I just need to pull my slides. Okay. And I may or may not need to mute my own mic so we can hear yours. Um, I, I'm muted. I don't know right now. Or I could just give you this. I can also just stand up there. Know. Um, you know, uh, try. Let's try having you use your own mic, and then I'll mute. I'll mute mine. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Um, Does that work? I I don't know because then it'll be coming in through the. Won't it come on? Like. Like, aren't there speakers playing the Zoom sound? Is what I'm saying. Wouldn't me speaking to the Zoom mic go over to the speakers and then? Um, I could probably mute that too. Let's see. Um, it says I'm on. Uh, I don't care. Oh, there we go. Test. Yeah, you might want to turn there. Can people on? Well, on Zoom, hear me? I hear you now. Yep. yep. Okay. Could okay, you mute I that? I mean, I thought it was. Okay, well, testing for echo. Okay, sounds like we're good on echo. Okay, so I will be. Do you want to stand up there or just from my seat? Okay. Okay. So my name is Elijah. Um, I went through the paper um, titled, uh, well, what it says there, an investigation of impulse buying behavior. Um, so basically the, the, the study was designed. Um, it seemed like to me because the authors had some skepticism about the existing perception of impulse buying, at least prior to their publication. Um, they talked about how impulse buying was viewed as inherently negative, and they sort of talked about how, um, you know, if this is the case, then why do people view their purchases positively, even though they impulse bought it? And, you know, why do people still impulse buy if it's viewed negatively? So um, in order to formulate their study, they conducted 60 semi-structured interviews um, with a convenient sample of individuals. They sort of um, uh, surfaced uh, topic, sort of the, the, the interviews were controlled such that neither the interviewees or the interviewers knew what the study topic was, other than that it was about shopping. 
Um, and this was important because um, if you ask people specifically about impulse buying, they might be impacted by their perceptions of it. Um, and they identified, uh, they focus on what they call the hedonic needs, hedonistic, you know, looking at sort of like people's desires for fun, novelty, and variety. Um, but they also talked about other potential impacts like information overload um, and social things. So from this, they designed and tested a Likert scale battery of tests. They found correlations within some of the tests. Um, and they also found bet sort of between the test batteries, they found, you know, that the hedonic needs correlated with impulsivity, desires for self-actualization and steam with a particular focus on the idea of style correlated with impulsiveness and perceived accuracy of purchase correlated with the higher impulsiveness, not moderate impulsiveness apparently. Um, and so with that summary, I wanted to talk about a few questions, uh, basically any of these questions that people have thought about, thoughts about, what are the limitations of the methods? Um, how about the author's perspective as marketing researchers have impacted their analysis? To what extent do you think their results generalize? And particularly, what does online shopping do to this? Um, and do you buy their results? Okay, let's see. I'll... Can folks hear me now? Yes. Okay. So we successfully transitioned the mics. Cool. All right. So th thanks for the summary. Let me let me open this up a bit. Um, I we, we said this was a lecture on theory first of all, and I didn't hear much discussion in the summary, much mention of theory. So can somebody help me understand? You know, what is this theory that I speak of? Or uh, alleged theory. They didn't mean to say they, they formulated their theory. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think exactly what um, Elijah said about grounded theory. I think it seems like they didn't really have a good sense of sort of the landscape. And so they wanted to use a grounded theory approach to kind of structure interviews to kind of get a sense of the landscape in terms of what's going to I uh, That bit is a little bit fuzzy to me. Um, and then it seems like based on those, it could generate some hypotheses that they could then quantitate. So it seems like it was like a multi-part. Yeah, cool. So thanks for this comment. So I agree with this. I, I noticed that too. Yeah, please. That one thing. I think somewhere in the introduction, the authors mentioned there is an existing theory on impulsive behavior in general, but they didn't think it applied to this specific uh -huh. instance. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Yeah, we're getting somewhere. So the let me try to summarize the comments so far. So the... There was some theory, right? The, the paper talks about impulse buying, studies impulse buying, right? So this phenomenon where you, I don't know, end up buying crap on impulse that you maybe didn't need or, you know, maybe you wouldn't have bought if you had more time to think about it, right? You know, that happens presumably to all of us, yeah, impulse buying. It could be, you know, online these days. It could be in a physical store. It could be whatever, right? So the paper studies this phenomenon on impulse buying and you know, prior to this paper's appearance, existence, there was some theory in the world about why people make impulse purchases, right? People had studied, so this was not the first ever paper to study impulse buying. There had been previous studies on impulse buying, uh, and there was some existing theory, we're going to call this a theory, about why people make these impulse purchases. Uh, right, and and according to this pre-existing literature slash theory, 
um, there's some stigma associated with making impulse purchases, right? That people, you know, that it's a bad thing to do and that people should feel bad for making impulse purchases and that they're generally uh, bad purchases to make or less optimal uh, purchases that they probably wouldn't make otherwise. Right, so that's where the paper starts. And, and then claims that, you know, maybe this theory that we had about impulse purchasing is incomplete, uh, right? Maybe it's, or incorrect, if you will, but incomplete is maybe a more precise term, but maybe it's not, it doesn't quite capture you know, all of what's going on with impulse purchases, right? And, you know, we're going to show in this paper, you know, all the ways in which that theory can be further extended. So, uh, and you're right, thank you, Jenny. Uh, they, it's a two-part study. The first part is the part that builds this theory extension, if you will, B builds this theory addition, right? Adds, you know, adds these hypotheses about, you know, why, what are some other reasons why people might make impulse purchases? Um, and, you know, that they're not necessarily uh, uh, bad and uh, that there's this, you know, this, I don't know, intrinsic, uh, I don't know, predisposition to make impulse purchases that we have as humans. Uh, and this general stigma that exists around making impulse purchases just acts as a, a moderator of that. It's kind of holding us back from you know, making these purchases. Um, but there's this you know, innate thing and it serves a whole bunch of other purposes. You know, maybe it gives us pleasure or fun or it's enjoyable in some other way that people hadn't really considered. Um, uh, so you know, it comes up with these additional possible explanations for how and why people make impulse purchases. How does it do this? Like, where do they, how do they come up with these, these additional possible explanations? Let's see, somebody on Zoom that has looked at the paper. Where do they derive these, I don't know, additional explanations from, and why is that a good idea? How might one do this? Am I am I muted on Zoom or understandable? Okay, Madeline says yes. Um, thank you. So somebody here. How do they come up with these? They come up through the with the five hypothesis using um, by kind of triangulating their theories based on their interview study and then also some different uh, existing in psychology like information processing theory like the objective criteria theory and the cognitive effort theory which they use to make hypothesis for and then 5a and 5b cool so yeah cool so they remember we talked about this was lecture one exactly a week ago we talked about the social constructivist perspective where uh, we you know, build theory from observations rather than you know it kind of magically existing from somewhere else right so that's what they did they ran 60 interviews with a bunch of people you know asking them about their uh, purchasing behaviors and impulse purchasing behaviors and they came up with these five was it hypotheses that were all novel relative to you know pre-existing theory that existed you know before the, this paper came out right so whatever humankind knew about impulse purchasing before the study right they extended with these five additional things that could also explain how and why make uh, people make impulse purchases uh, different mechanisms right for people making these impulse purchases and they derive those from the ground up right after talking to you know in this case 60 people and analyzing carefully you know the things that those people said so we're going to talk a lot more about how to run interviews very soon and how to analyze data from interviews and all of this that will all be coming up uh, but the general point is they derive this 
from observations and they abstracted away from these 60 you know, observations and tons of things that those people told them, they abstracted away these additional mechanisms through which impulse purchases can happen, right? And then they derived these five, or they, they uh, laid out, they spelled out these five additional hypotheses, new hypotheses, um, describing these mechanisms, right? That's the first part of the study, right? First part of the study says, you know, here's the existing theory about this phenomenon, and here's a grounded study based on observations or talking to 60 people that seems to suggest some additional mechanisms beyond what was already known, right? And, you know, we hypothesize that these things would also hold more generally, you know, beyond the 60 people that we happened to talk to. That's the first part of the paper, right? The second part of the paper then goes and tests those five hypotheses. How do they do that? They use electric scale tests, basically. Some, some kind of survey? Yeah, yeah. a survey with, uh, I didn't like participants. Um, basically, Likert scale questions, including some existing scales. But basically, to see correlations between what they infer to be measures of what the, they're looking at, which is, you know, the construct validity is the question. But. Okay, yeah, cool. So they, uh, this is important. They they uh, collected new data from a different sample of people, right? You know, we, and we could talk about maybe limitations of how they did that. But the point is, they collected new data from a different sample of people through a survey or questionnaire. And then they use some kind of you know, statistical analysis to test those hypotheses quantitatively on this new data that they collected. And so that's sort of, that's the study design, right? It's a two part study. The first part is this grounded from the ground up, from observations, this grounded theory building exercise that resulted in hypotheses Hypotheses are, uh, I don't know, uh, instantiations of some theory, right? Um, and then they went with the second part, you know, collected new data uh, and did some statistical analysis of that data to test whether those hypotheses are supported or refuted or whatever, you know, on this new sample, right? Then, you know, they found that I think most of them were supported or something. Yeah, the one they could not support because they said the battery, the tech, the questions didn't perform well in the survey. Right. So that's that's interesting. The interesting meta point is, you know, if if you don't find, I guess, if you find evidence in the second analysis you know, for the things you hypothesized, maybe you're happy and you call it a day. If you don't find evidence, you know, for the things you hypothesize, evidence in line with your theory, right? Then you know that could be for any number of reasons, right? It could be that your theory was wrong. It could be that your measurement was wrong, and I think that's what they're arguing. You know, maybe the way we measured this particular construct uh, for this particular hypothesis, you know, was not ideal, right? So you know, maybe future work should go back and like revisit this and try to do this in a better way. Okay? So you see this a two part, again, like two part study with first building theory from the ground up. They could, have, they could have stopped there, by the way, that could have been a paper by itself, right? And often we do this, uh, we, yeah, I guess, I guess the um, um, surgical teams paper that we talked about a little bit last week, uh, this ethnography you know, uh, of collaboration or coordination and the surgical teams, more or less stop with this, right? They had built this theory of how these people coordinate in these, I don't know, uh, high importance uh, environments in surgical teams, and they stopped there, uh, as, as I remember. Right, so you, you could have stopped there. Here they went, you know, basically they did a second paper in, in, in one, and they also went and they tested, you know, using a, diff using a different method, these hypotheses, their, their theory, the part of the theory they uh, derived. Okay, that makes sense? So by the way, so this is an example, since we're talking about projects, this is an example of how one might use different research methods as part of the same research study, right? You know, so here, the, uh, this qualitative approach was useful to build this theory in the first place. 
And then they had a quantitative approach to test specific hypotheses derived from this theory that they had built in the first place. Uh, in that sense, I think it's a good example. Um, okay, let's talk about the second one. Uh, and I will mute myself and hopefully you can. Okay, I'm gonna. Okay. Oh. Oh. Hello. Ah, fantastic. Okay. Sorry. I was just waiting for no echo. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. Um, and uh, I'm, I don't really have fancy slides to present on this paper, so you're just going to listen to me talk. Um, hopefully that's enough. But um, this paper was a paper, I think, published in 2007, kind of studying like the relationships essentially between certain profile elements on Facebook with relation to the number of friends in someone's social network. Um, for context, which I found somewhat amusing. Um, 2007 Facebook is certainly very different than the Facebook landscape than today. So they're looking at the time when Facebook was targeted specifically college campuses. So this is a slightly different context than what we're maybe used to, or at least I'm personally used to for Facebook. So um, in particular, I think for the study, what they're really looking for, just to spell out some of the research questions, is the relationship between certain profile elements with respect to the number of friends. And not only that, they're not even looking at the existence of relationships, they're also trying to understand sort of the strength of these relationships, the profile elements to um, the number of friends on Facebook. And so theory, I think, has a pretty big role to play in particular for the study. So um, it has a play, role to play in the motivation. So they kind of talk about three main sort of psychological or economic theories that they sort of draw upon to make some sort of um, reasonable hypotheses or inferences um, that they uh, for the study. So diving into each one, they talked about signaling theory, which is basically this, if I understand it correctly, this idea of um, in like as social people, we kind of like exhibit signals to people that says something about ourselves. So for instance, the example they give is like um, someone who, you know, like can lift 300 pounds is a sign of that they're pretty strong. Um, but we also have this idea of reliability of signals. So, you know, like someone that can lift 300, 500 pounds on the deadlift, probably pretty strong, but someone that's wearing a Gymshark t-shirt or a Gold's Gym t-shirt might not be necessarily strong because anyone can really get that. So there's this idea of strength or reliability of, in, of signals and signaling theory. Um, for common ground theory, um, this is this idea basically that people with similar um, maybe backgrounds or um, I guess things like that or interests might have an a, a easier way of connecting with each other. Um, and they they send, kind of presuppose that there's sort of sort of the same idea on Facebook profiles, right? That like if you say, hey, I'm from this hometown or hey, I'm from this high school, that you might have more common ground with someone else. Um, finally, they also have this idea of transaction costs, which is basically the cost incurred that um, during economic exchange, that's the economic theory. But the authors kind of hypothesize that with common ground, I'm sorry wrong theory, uh, transactions cost theory, you know, it can be hard to find people. Um, and so um, say adding more details to your profile may make it easier to find folks on Facebook and stuff like that. So this is sort of, as I understand it, a little bit more on um, providing metadata to be able to be more easily found by people. And so um, that's sort of the theory. And um, they use those three theories in particular in the like in the intro and like related work to kind of build up this motivation to get them to these ideas that maybe profile signals might be relevant in terms of how many friends people have. And so the way that they sort of test this is um, they kind of, what they do is they look at the Michigan State University Facebook group and they grab basically 33,000 public profiles from there, which include like undergraduates, graduate students, staff, professors, and things like that. And then what they do is they sort of identify um, they grab all the data, profile data from these 32,000, I think, profiles, and then they kind of um, extract out sort of groups of relevant variables um, based on the profile data. So they're looking at these things called control variables, which are basically signals that are known to have social network effects like gender, and I forget what the other one was. Um, they're also looking at um, 
what were the other ones? Oh, they're also looking at things called referent variables, which are basically things that sort of put you at a specific like location, I believe. So for instance, like hometown, high school, things like that. Um, and then they also look at um, preferences. So they look at your personal interests, like do you like certain musics, um, interests, things like that. And then finally, sorry, I'm losing my place in my notes. Um, they also have like contact information. So things like your birthday, um, I think your relationship status, things that basically kind of imply that you'd like to take a sort of like relationship from online to offline. And so given all these variables, they do two things. One, they look at the um, Pearson's R correlation variable um, between that sort of individual variable uh, along with the uh, number of friends that people have within their MSU network and outside their MSU network. Um, and then they also, um, they use that to identify basically singular relevant variables. But there's also some interesting factors to say, like what are the, you know, a group of variables that explain um, the variation amongst the samples. So what they do is they use a multivariate linear modeling basically. And they, I think created a linear model with, I think they had 10 factors or some number, a decent amount that basically explained about 40% of the variation within their sample. So um, some relevant factors that I can remember off the top of my head were like, I think like whether they were an undergraduate or not. Um, they also found that I think the referent variable index was like most salient as well. Um, and so through that, they're kind of be able to, through these sort of pairs and R's as well as this like multiple linear regression, they're able to kind of tell like what sort of um, uh, variables are, you know, have a relationship with the, um, the number of friends that you have. But not only that, they're able, also able to tell the strength of that relationship. So um, in terms of methods, I think quantitative methods, the reason why they selected this is probably the most reasonable way to kind of tell the relationship between, you know, um, these profile signals with the number of friends. I don't think qualitative methods would have really made very much sense, um, unless if you're trying to get into the why of it. Um, and I guess another point that I wanted to make regarding theory is that they also really use this theory to also interpret some of the results, which I found sort of interesting. So I think for instance, I actually don't have specific examples, but I do remember they said things in the discussion section, like from a blank theory lens, you might interpret, you know, these results to um, this way or that way. So I think that is the long TLDR, I believe, of this paper. But let me know if I missed anything. Am I back? Yep. All right, thanks. Uh, let's see. So what did I do with... Okay, so let me ask you a few things here. I, you said, like, I'm, I'm a little confused about the study. You said three theories. Not one theory. How does that work? How can you have a bunch of theories? I guess the way um, that I saw it was you had a sort of cause, effect, and context. And each of the three theories fit into a role explaining a potential explanation for the fact there are hypothesis. It's essentially of the signaling is your, your cause. You're putting these informational markers in your profile. The effect is the um, term you use general or common ground um, theory in, in, in the sense of these signaling markers allow you to associate with other people with similarities. So in the context that makes this different from like any typical social type thing, the fact that it's easy to search. Uh huh. Uh huh. So so interesting, right? Interesting how you know there. So first of all. The theories, the three, they didn't create them, right? The authors of this paper did not build or create those theories, right? They refer to them, but they existed you know, somewhere else. Second, um, it seems that for the particular phenomenon they're studying, which is people creating uh, friendship links on Facebook, 
Um, there exist multiple theories that touch on different aspects of you know this phenomenon. I, you know, one is about how much information you put into your profile. The second is you know wh which information you choose to uh, disclose. Uh, you know, all of these things, right, that touch on different aspects of this phenomenon of creating links in this network, right? So you can see how, you know, A, the, they start from somebody else's theories, um, not at all designed or derived for this domain, presumably. I, I, you know, I don't think uh, signaling theory is a well-known theory in economics. Uh, that people came up with this when they were looking at job markets, related things, et cetera. Um, you know, people weren't thinking of the Facebook social network app, you know, in the 60s or whenever they came up with signaling theory and economics, right? So, but at the same time, you know, this theory as one example, one of the three, you know, explains something that is also relevant, you know, in this particular new domain, right? And the authors, you know, argue how these existing theories of the world apply to their particular domain and to uh, specifically three theories apply to different aspects of this phenomenon they're studying. Okay, so interesting. Um, and also interesting that, uh, so, so is this, you know, what, what philosophical worldview is this? Is this the same as the previous one? Is it different? Why is it different? Why is it the same? Anybody that we haven't heard from already that has thought about this or has an opinion or has read the paper or is awake? or all of the above at the same time. Like is, the question is, is this the same or different approach to research compared to the previous paper? Is this, I don't know, constructivist or objectivist and, and why? I'll, I'll read you a message from Sam in chat. Sam says, having multiple theories makes sense, right? Science mirrors reality's fractal structure. We have lower level theories of physics, but also increasingly higher level theories of chemistry, biology, psychology, sociology, economics, etc. And each time you abstract more, you have more of an opportunity to choose which kinds of phenomena you focus on. Right. So it's so this is about you know how maybe it's not so strange in hindsight that there be multiple theories of relevance to this particular phenomenon. Uh, thank you. I agree with this. Is it uh, social constructivist or is it, what was the other one? Objectivist? De deductive? Which one is it? Yes. This one is objectivist because they're starting with the theory the, and they're then collecting data and then looking at it through that lens. And which is completely the opposite of the first paper, which was starting with the data and then building the theory from that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so uh, I agree with this. I think I think that's also my read of this. Like this is sort of the you know objectivist worldview of science, where they start with the theory and they test it. Um, and you could think of the second part of the first paper as being this too, if you will, right? So the, you know, for for the second part of the first paper. There already existed this theory. They had, form they had formulated hypotheses. It could have just as well been a different set of authors, you know, doing that work, right? There existed some theory, and they they went about testing it, right? So the the first paper is actually really interesting in that it sort of combines, to me, both of these worldviews into one one publication, right? Where they say, you know, we don't know enough about this phenomenon. Let's build a theory to better understand it, and then you know, let's find more evidence in support of this. Uh, but I agree. So you see, you know, this hopefully very clearly this difference in approach to research in the first place between the two papers, at least the first part of the first paper and the second paper. Right? One is building theory, the other one is testing. Yes. I just wanted to ask a question about the second paper because it seemed to me that the results they had were pretty weak. The correlations they found were looked to be like extremely weak. And I was wondering if having this objectivist perspective of trying to fit these theories to their data, yeah. like, are those really the cause of the, of the correlation or not? And 
it seems like they're kind of forcing the fit there. Yeah, that's a really good question, right? I guess the question is, uh, what constitutes enough evidence for or against, a, you know, particular in support of or or uh, against a particular hypothesis or theory, right? And you're saying, you know, may, maybe here there wasn't as strong a, a evidence as you would have liked, right? Um, so that's a really good point. I agree with this. What's the solution? So first of all, first of all, let me ask the frame. Does it mean that uh, you know the theory does not hold? Right, them observing arguably uh, weak correlations, does that mean that the theory is wrong? Unless, unless the theory requires strong correlations. I mean, if you're saying this is the only factor that causes it and then you find a weak correlation, that's going to be a problem. Okay, yeah. So. That's a good point. So, you know, all of these human behavioral phenomena are always very complex and always subject to lots of factors and confounding variables and so on. So it's probably very hard to get something very clean, you know, numerically, quantitatively, statistically with any human behavioral study of any kind. I think that's true. What else? Did you have Okay, thank you, Luke. So I, let me qualify my question. So I asked, I asked incorrectly, I asked you earlier, you know, does this mean the theory doesn't hold in general? Certainly does not. I, yeah, I think I agree with this directly. Uh, um, you know, does it mean that it doesn't hold in this particular context? Let me ask the more specific question. Is, is that a valid conclusion? Courtney? No, you can't prove that with the hypothesis. You can only fail to accept the hypothesis. You can't prove the hypothesis is false. That's also, uh, that's also a good point. We'll come back and talk more about causality. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh, we'll talk some other time about this. Yeah, something else. I'm just going to add that we're also looking at like second level constructs here where we're not even like directly talking about the, the first level of like what actions do they take because the authors pointed out that you can't really study post hoc like it's not, it's hard to just post hoc look at purchasing behavior. So they're looking at like answers to questions about purchasing behavior. So it's like one layer abstracted almost from the direct thing that you're trying to measure, which I think makes it harder to get like strong correlations necessarily, but I don't know. Yeah, so I guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at, and I think you're, you're pointing in the same direction, um, it's probably always the case that um, no individual study is ever sufficient to prove or disprove anything or uh, to, to give you, you know, all the evidence you would ever possibly want or to conclusively reject some, you know, uh, theory or hypothesis. Like no single study can probably ever do that ever in any domain. So I think what you see happening in practice is this, you know, gradual and arguably very slow uh, consensus reaching mechanism that you know over probably decades in some cases and you know maybe many conflicting studies at times uh some sort of consensus seems to emerge i mean look at also look at these complex uh decisions around i don't know vaccination and all of these other things right um you know that that all of these human social phenomena are just so complex that is very hard, if not impossible, to you know definitively prove or disprove anything with a single study, you know, with one experimental design, right? So you know you always need you know replications and you know contextual factors and refinements and, and all of this other stuff, right? That you know, gradually over time you come to some conclusion that you know you trust with confidence, right? So you know here, I would say like I would I would read this and I would say you know the theory um, is 
well established you know outside of this particular context right people have uh, you know tested and validated those theories probably time and again in other domains uh, the author's argumentation the logic for why those things apply to their phenomena uh, phenomenon seems sound so I, I buy that you know translation of you know, theory to specific hypotheses in their domain right uh, and they find you know supporting evidence right so you know I, I believe the theory I believe the analytical process for applying the theory to their domain and they find some some supporting evidence so this seems you know credible to me but I would of course you know I agree with you I would want to see this replicated I would want to see you know maybe an experimental like randomized uh, control study you know all of these other things right about that would give me more confidence that this is really what's going on uh, I agree but but on the surface right this is to me sort of consistent right with um, the, the claims they're making Um, let's see. I, I hear some pessimism and um, in the Zoom call. Can anybody elaborate? Sophia, I'm going to pick on you. Hello. Oh, sorry. Assuming I was talking. Awake. Yeah, I was talking about earlier when you were asking about the the data, um, whether or not a low correlation is enough to disprove the theory. Did you agree or disagree with that? I disagreed. That uh, low correlation disproves the theory. A lack of a local relation disproves the theory in general, which I think was like not. I think that's sort of what everyone was saying. Um, yeah, thanks. So I guess, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. I think the other, somebody mentioned this earlier. The other point is, you know, what if they, what if the theory is not wrong, but the way they measured the construct, you know, is, is imperfect, right? So, you know, it, the lack of strong correlation could very well be a result of, you know, imperfect measurement, right? Not of uh, invalid theory, right? So that's another thing to keep in mind. All right. Yeah, right. I think very that's good. sort of what I interpreted from like what Courtney said is the same thing, but in more formal terms. Um, so yeah, that's what I was talking about. Sorry, that message was very unclear. <laughs> no, no, th thanks for clarifying. And this was this was useful. And actually, I forgot to mention that. So thank you very much. Uh, all right, very good. So um, hopefully you've gotten a flavor of the two arguably very different studies that both use theory in arguably some interesting ways. So let's keep going on this a little bit more. Um, we talked about, you know, what is a theory? Well, a theory is you know, any set of propositions that are logically related, expressing some relationships among possibly different constructs uh, and possibly other propositions that have already been expressed. So th that's a theory. So anything that expresses uh, you know, uh, propositions and relationships between constructs. Let's see. Um, right. So, you know, what do you need to have a theory? You need to identify the constructs. You need to make assertions about them, about their nature or their relationships. You know, some uh, theories uh, are more descriptive. Others uh, make claims make assertions about causal relationships between constructs others better still uh, explain also the mechanism through which those causal relationships manifest okay so the, my favorite example of this that i've probably given a million times by now is the vitamin c scurvy example right it took about a hundred years between when they uh, had this theory this causal relationship theory between, uh, sorry, between oranges uh, and curing scurvy, which is one of these diseases that uh, people were facing in the 1700s, and I believe is now extinct. extinct. Um, they, it took about 100 years between when they uh, had this causal theory of how you know, oranges or lack thereof are related to scurvy, 
and the mechanism, the biological mechanism through which that happens, which is the sort of vitamin C deficiency. Right, so that took about a hundred years, right? So the point is, um, you know, uh, you could have a theory that describes these causal relationships, but still have no idea why, like what's the mechanism through which that relationship occurs. Uh, these two are sort of different things. The mechanism is different from the relationship itself. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, right, so we talked about, you know, various kinds of theories ranging from descriptive to predictive. Uh, they're all, they're all possible. Right, uh, and this was, I think, Sam's point in the uh, Zoom chat earlier about how, you know, theories can operate at different levels of abstraction and can have different explanatory power, ranging from micro level things to, you know, grand uh, theories of, I don't know, society or gravity or what have you, uh, and, you know, anything in between. Uh, arguably, this example of signaling theory we talked about earlier is, you know, somewhere in between. It doesn't quite explain all of the world, but it also explains, you know, some a sizable chunk of it. So it's not, it's not a, I don't know, micro level interaction. Sorry, yes. So, Sam, thanks for clarifying. Uh, I, my, Use of the term extinct was uh, inappropriate here. I meant, uh, you know, we, well within our control because we understand how to uh, avoid it, uh, not that it cannot occur anymore. Thanks. Um, okay. So, this, we saw this very clearly in the examples. We saw how you could have different theories that address different aspects of some phenomenon. That was the Facebook relationship. Uh, paper um, and you could have even different theories that uh, address the same aspect of some phenomenon and perhaps compete you could have competing theories you know for the same something and then you know you, you find evidence in support of one or the other and you know maybe over time you end up uh, entirely rejecting one in favor of the other once you've collected enough evidence. So, you know, all of this is possible. Um, okay, and we talked about how uh, the, the two papers were maybe examples of the social constructivist worldview and the viral market, sorry, the, the impulse purchasing paper um, and the positivist worldview and the Facebook relationship paper. Um, okay, so that's all fine. You can read more about this uh in the readings right so take a look at these two papers uh for uh, i don't know next time or next week we may or may not have another quiz about this if bobo is so kind to uh, help us make some questions uh, but you take a look at these i want to spend uh, some time that we have left Bringing this a little closer to home, you know, because maybe maybe you're all going to be skeptical and you're going to argue that you know this is all fine, but this is I don't know social sciences, behavioral sciences, economics, what have you. You know, a lot of us are uh, building specific tools or things like working on very practical software engineering problems, maybe. Um, and very technical things. And, you know, all of this does not apply because we're working on very technical, you know, uh, aspects of, of our domain. And this is all, you know, too high level for the kinds of things we're working on. Um, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that is not the case. Um, so you will probably face these uh, as well. And I wanna give you an example. So this is an anecdote of Stu. Uh, Stu Dent is, say, uh, nine months into uh, his PhD uh, at CMU, um, and he is working on uh, some AI system that can automatically generate programming source code given some natural language text as input, kind of like Copilot. So Stu is maybe building a Copilot. Um, and He's built some prototype, right? Stu has some model uh, that uh, is able to do something like this and now needs an evaluation plan 
to demonstrate to readers and reviewers of his upcoming ICSI submission or FSC submission in the spring that uh, you know, this is a worthwhile paper and uh, uh, tool to have, okay? So that's the context. So here's Stu's evaluation plan. Um, Stu, you know, obviously knows about research methods. So uh, it's uh, the designing an actual controlled experimental study, um, and he's built an IDE plugin that uh, you know allows programmers access to this particular tool. Um, he is so thought of these two uh, conditions. One is um, you know writing code or or completing some tasks in this experiment using this AI. We call it NL2 code here. You could call it copilot if you will. Um, that's one condition. The other condition is just writing code from scratch. Okay, so you know, writing code using this NL2 uh, code plugin or writing code from scratch. That's the independent uh, variable. That's the interesting condition. That's what Stu is hoping to test. He's hoping to test you know, the value of using this kind of uh, AI. Now, uh, he is thinking of measuring a bunch of things that are maybe relevant in this context, you know, like program correctness or task completion speed, or even subjective assessments that people give of using this tool after they've completed the tasks, right? So, you know, he brings a bunch of people into the lab and gives them a bunch of tasks uh, and, measures objectively uh, how correct their solutions are and measures objectively how quickly people arrive at those solutions right uh, in these two conditions uh, and you know may maybe also uh, ask for their subjective uh, opinions of you know what it was like using uh, this tool or completing the tasks in one condition versus the other okay um and has a bunch of uh, tasks, say, you know, prior programming uh, tasks in Python, ranging from, I don't know, data science things, maybe at the more complex end to some, you know, file manipulation and basic uh, IO things at the simpler end than, you know, anything between a uh, range of tasks, okay? Um, and recruits a bunch of computer science graduate students to participate in the study, okay? So now Stu has a number of hypotheses. Uh, one that writing code, uh, sorry, the code written using this AI is more often correct than the code written from scratch. You know, therefore the AI helps people write better code. The other that people complete their tasks faster when they're using this AI compared to when they're writing code from scratch. Uh, and finally, uh, that people prefer uh, you know, uh, using these code snippets uh, generated by the AI over the ones that they uh, wrote from scratch or, or something like this. Okay, so three hypotheses, each testing one of these three relevant outcome measures, uh, right? Task correctness, uh, task completion speed, and I don't know, impressions of using this one. Okay. So, you know, Stu does this, recruits, a, I don't know, a bunch of people and have uh, has them complete all these tasks, uh, collects all this data, analyzes it, and there's no evidence supporting either one of them. None of them pan out, none. No difference, no difference in any of these dimensions between the two conditions at all. Uh, and moreover, people found the AI to be unintuitive and uh, they didn't really like it. So just as an aside, this is totally a true story. Um, this is, uh, you can find the link here. This is absolutely 100% true story. Uh, a student that I work with went through literally the experience I've described here. Uh, and we wrote a paper about it uh, with the kind of things we learned after doing it. But it's you know, totally true story, so it can absolutely happen, uh, including the uh, fact that none of the hypotheses were supported. Okay, so what's going on? What is this? 
like, I think you'll agree that on the surface, everything that I've sort of described in terms of how we set this up seems reasonable. You know, and, and it was an actual experiment with, you know, random assignment and all that. So what's going on? Like, wh why did we fail? So, you know, clearly here. Yeah, any, any ideas? Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, shouldn't we, uh, you know, like all have a, Sense of the results even before doing the experiment. So yeah, so Stu, who built this, uh, you know, AI, yeah. obviously did some, you know, uh, local testing of it, right? And you know, was happy that the AI, you know, does useful things, you know, often enough, and that you know produces useful, good code snippets, etc. Right. So the uh, you know, the creator obviously believed that this was ready for a you know, human study with actual programmers before doing this. And there, you know, there has been some training set, test set sort of uh, evaluation you know, prior to, to doing this, you know, that showed encouraging results on the, you know, on the test set. So we, yeah, so thank you. That's a really good question. We had, we had done all of that already. Uh, maybe uh, I just need more information. Please, yeah. Yeah, so all of these are good questions. So uh, what I can tell you so far is, you know, in terms of measurement, each task, so you know, every participant completed some number of tasks uh, in, in either condition, you know, half were with the AI, half were without the AI. So it was a within subjects design. Um, and there were a number of participants uh, completing the study overall. So, you know, there was a lot of data from, you know, all of the participants and their individual tasks and each task was rated on correctness on some numerical scale and then there was some statistical analysis you know, comparing the correctness scores you know between the two conditions so that's sort of the setup uh, and that analysis the statistics there showed no statistically significant differences between conditions in terms of correctness scores so that's the that's the premise and that's what we're trying to debug here together yeah, any, any other ideas? I think, and this is a problem across evaluating any tool, is that you're not, if, if it's just like the first time someone has used something, they may not have time to learn it or get used to it and use it effectively. Cool, yeah, so that's also possible. Um, right, so, you know, how are we confident that people knew how to use the tool or using it correctly, et cetera, et cetera. All, all of these are valid questions to, to raise. What else? It seems like the question here is like uh, the, the tool has to have some sort of underlying set of assumptions about how people generate ideas and think about stuff. Or, and it seems like the study is taking that set of assumptions and seeing if they apply versus like or apply in the form of the tool, but it, it, it doesn't seem to do any sort of independent confirmation of do these assumptions about how people think about code actually apply to this cool so uh, i was i don't know if you heard that i hope you heard that on the zoom call too this is really the point like this is where i'm getting with this um like i'm trying to show you how you know even in this you know, arguably very relatable scenario on a very technical type of project um there's still this need to articulate assumptions and the, you know, the underlying theory that would sort of explain when and how and why you might expect and for whom and under what conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you might expect to see these differences, right? So my point here is ultimately that, you know, as described on this slide, right, this is not a great design of an evaluation study because it doesn't articulate you know, neither it articulates neither these underlying assumptions about how people program in general, how they might use tools like these, et cetera, et cetera, nor 
you know, the underlying theory about, you know, wh why these, uh, you know, hypotheses should hold, you know, under what conditions, right? So it, it, it tests very generically, you know, these things that seem plausible on the surface, but really without kind of going into the nitty gritty details of how and why and when and under what conditions and for whom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But right? that's the part that's missing. The part that's missing is the theory. That's what I'm trying to, to get to. Um, so, so let me see if I can uh, illustrate this. And you know, we talked about, all right, so here, here are some more of the things that you brought up or that I had written down. You know, so first of all, what does it mean for the task to be completed correctly? And how is that measured? You know, to what extent is that subjective? How is speed measured? You know, to what extent is that a valid measurement? So when we talk about things like these, we generally talk about construct validity issues, right? So to what extent are these constructs of correctness and speed, et cetera, are these constructs valid? Or, or you know, maybe there's something in the way we uh, measured or defined these that threatens their validity and therefore you know, th threatens the validity of the study as a whole. That's one class of things. Um, how familiar were the people with these kinds of uh, IDE plugins and AI systems and whatnot? So that talks about basically internal validity, right? So if, if the people were unaware of systems like these, you know, who knows what they were actually doing when we thought they were using these systems, you know? You know, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, maybe they weren't in like weird ways. You know, who knows what was going on, right? So is, are we really testing what we think we're testing, right? With the study design, the way we had set it up. Um, then, you know, were the tasks representative? Is this something that, uh, you know, is super artificial, which is a common thread to lab studies? You know, is this, you have to simplify the world enough to be able to test it in a one hour study, say in a lab setting, right? Is that realistic of things that people might actually do in the wild? But you know, even if there is a difference in this artificial lab setting, you know, could you expect that to translate to something also out in the real world? Um, what about the population itself? The sample of uh, computer science grad students, is that representative of people, you know, programming out in the world? Certainly not, it's like we already know this, you know, so these kinds of questions talk about external validity um, issues and you know there's lots of these um, there's also this idea of theoretical reliability you know people actually you know obviously knew that you know they, they knew which condition they were in right and they knew that they were using this tool that uh, fellow students of theirs had built you know so were they more you know uh, were they influenced by this in any way? Were they more likely to be kind to their friends about their use of their tool? You know, things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's entire classes of threats to the validity of research studies, empirical research studies, and we shall talk about them ad nauseum throughout the semester. It's basically what this class is all about, is, you know, kind of recognizing these and trying to avoid them in the first place. Uh, so, you know, obviously lots of these are also relevant here. Um, so, yeah, okay. So um, I talked about how, you know, all of this theory was missing in this context, right? So when you talk about, you know, is drug A better than drug B in a medical setting, you don't usually, uh, you know, think about it that blindly uh, or, or that naively rather. You, you try to, you know, uh, incorporate, you know, all of this important contextual uh, knowledge into the way you're answering that question, right? So, you know, first of all, why would you expect it to be better? Do you have some theory of the causal relationship or the un underlying mechanism? You know, better when? Is it always better? Is it better in some conditions? Is it better for some kinds of patients or and not for others? You know, why might that be? You know, better in what ways are doing what? Measured how, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all of these you know, important context questions that one must answer uh, when uh, even evaluating very technical artifacts that uh, lots of us uh, often build in our in our field. Um, so yeah, so the point is you've got to have a theory. Even still here needs to have a theory. So here are you know, here's what was missing or part of what was missing in Stu's set up originally. So first of all, you know, lots of background assumptions here that Stu had not articulated. 
for example, that you know, these kind of programming tasks can be completed by piecing together code fragments that involve, I don't know, popular libraries and API methods and things like this. Um, and that many such examples of code fragments are part of the training data for this AI system and so on and so forth, right? So all of these, you know, background underlying assumptions, right? Before you even start thinking about how you might evaluate this. Um, and then, you know, here, here's a, a fragment, right? Of Stu's basic theory uh, that should have been there before the study was designed. Um, for example, let's say programmers decompose tasks into a sequence of typically small steps. And at every step, they know conceptually what must be done next, but A, either don't know how to create a concrete implementation of that conceptual idea, or B, maybe they do know how to create an implementation, but they'd rather just not type it in if they could save some keystrokes. Maybe they are lazy, right? Um, and so, you know, when would a system like this, an AI like this, be useful? Well, it could probably help speed up task completion, especially in the second scenario, right? When people know how to write the code, but they would just rather not have to if they can avoid it. You know, that's a scenario in which you might expect them to be faster right, at completing programming tasks with an AI like this, right? In the first scenario, they are arguably less likely to uh, benefit from this, but because if they don't know how to write that implementation in the first place, you know, even if they don't know conceptually what they must do, but they don't know how to write the code, you know, will they actually recognize that the code suggested by this AI is the right code for them to use? You know, so like there's all of this cognitive stuff that has to happen for them to you know, realize that that is actually the right solution for their particular problem, right? And unless they are able to do that efficiently, right? You know, a system like this cannot possibly help speed their work up, right? Because, you know, whatever they're saving on keystrokes, they're spending or more on, you know, understanding these uh, things that they did not write in the first place. Right? Do you see that? Do you see the point? There's a very different settings here, right? And, you know, if a system like this would help anyone, it would be people in the second, scenario more than people in the first, by right? people that can actually uh, gauge the validity of these suggestions made by the AI, right? And you know, can, can then incorporate them quickly. Okay, and like, wh why would these speed ups occur? Well, for example, they could occur uh, maybe primarily because if people context switch out of the IDE to look for these uh, examples in their browser, say, you know, to find them themselves from Stack Overflow or something and copy them and, and paste them into their um, programs, you know, maybe they get distracted or, or something, right? Uh, there's, you know, this cost of switching context out of your IDE, switching back into it, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and maybe it's not because of the time it would take them to actually write down the source code uh, because they don't actually write the source code anyway. Even when they don't have access to this AI system, they wouldn't write the source code themselves from scratch anyway. They would just go look for it on the internet and paste it in, right? That's right, there's no guarantee. So the, I think the point that here is, uh, what I'm trying to argue is that a system like this uh, could be expected to speed people's uh, uh, tasks up, especially when they can recognize that those things are correct. That's when I would expect to see the speed up more than when people don't recognize that the, ta the solutions are correct. But, um, assuming you're comparing this AI program with solving the same task on the internet, so uh, assuming the user does not have access to this and still needs to complete the task, they might want to go on Google and search up how to do this. There's no guarantee that they understand that code that they don't, but they might still continue the task because they just need to points that the environment provides. 
Um, I, I don't disagree with this. I think I think um, I think we're just talking about different things. So um, I um, so you're saying there's a, you're saying there's a chance people won't know. Who knows what the or what the code does, but they might also be people who just blindly trust the response. So they're not necessarily based on my understanding of what the code does because it's it's just a means to an end. Um, okay, yeah. So I, okay, fair enough. I, I take the point. I guess one thing that I uh, did not mention earlier is that you're typically with a system like this, uh, at least the one that uh, was actually part of this scenario I uh, described, you get a list of suggestions from the AI uh, and it's the end user's responsibility to choose one from this, you know, multiple that are presented to them. So there's still some, you know, choice. Uh, it's not that they trust blindly, you know, the topmost suggestion. You know, we could have designed it that way. You could do it that way. And, and, and then I agree with your point, you know, they could just trust it or not. Uh, but here they were still sort of making this decision you know, uh, as users of this AI to pick one of these suggestions uh, as the one they, you know, wanted to use. Yeah, the reason I brought that up is because they use a very similar tool and a lot of people like novice users had no idea what something was doing and they would still use it. They, they would outright say it out loud, like I have no idea what this does and they said it works and they just like move on. So they're not necessarily wasting time Fair enough. Right. So, so you know, maybe um, you know, maybe you would see different. So we we're talking about speed here. So you know, maybe in, in this setting, in the one you described, you would argue that you can expect to see some speed ups because you know people just blindly trust this and use it. But maybe you can expect to see, you know, uh, assuming the AI is imperfect, you know, you would expect to see uh, no difference in correctness or worse, you know, worse scores on correctness or things like that. Um, if they just blindly trust something that's given to them without really thinking about it at all, right? So you, know, you, could, you could argue all of those. I, my point here is not that this is the only theory, but rather that you need to have a theory you know, like this, where you argue through the specifics of your problem and your scenario, right? About how the effect might, might play out, right? And only with something like this, can you then go and design the study and sort of meaningfully interpret its conclusions. Uh, not, not that this is the only theory, by no means. Um, okay, question from Zoom. Is the implication here that to properly assess this AI, according to this theory, you need to give participants in the control case access to Stack Overflow? Yes, uh, participants in the control uh, had access to the browser. They could do whatever they wanted uh, with the browser. I forgot to mention that as well. Uh, and... Uh, uh, let me not repeat Nikita's uh, entire point because uh, we're kind of getting to the end of, of class now and I don't want to uh, take too much longer. I just wanted to, to wrap this up. So Sam, I'll, I'll, owe, you, I'll, I'll owe you an answer to, to your last question. Um, let me just end with this one thing. Um, you know, so here's a way in which Stu could have operationalized, could have used this theory that he had previously articulated to derive more specific hypotheses to then test. So for example, some hypotheses here could be that for tasks where programmers have extensive prior experience, meaning they could have written solutions from scratch if they chose to, and they knew therefore how to recognize the right answers, um, using this AI should reduce speed up times, right? But it is under these conditions that it would do that. It would maybe not do that in general for everyone on, on, you know, under any conditions, but rather specifically in these conditions. Or, you know, another one related, the more steps, meaning the more API calls are involved in implementing a particular solution to a particular task, um, the more opportunities there are for programmers to look up, you know, these API calls and how to connect them and all of that. Um, and you know, therefore, the more this AI could speed up task completion times, right? The more you use it. Uh, just as an aside, uh, one other thing that we saw uh, in the study was that you know, even in the treatment condition, people didn't actually always use the AI or use it that frequently. 
right? So, you know, ultimately you end up comparing the treatment condition with something that looks very similar to the treatment condition. If people didn't actually get too many opportunities to use the AI in the first place, or, you know, even if they had them, they didn't actually use the opportunities, right? Uh, so anyway, so, but these are all kinds, all things that we sort of, you know, learned um, as reflection items. And I really encourage you to take a look at this paper that I, uh, that I link somewhere. There's a, I guess here. Um, here, that, so it describes all of these lessons learned from our failed experiment, if you will. Uh, and you know, all of the reasons why we didn't see what we thought we would see initially. So that's kind of the point here. So I'll end with the, the obvious, uh, which is this. Um, you know, even for so even if you're not doing empirical studies designed to build theory or to uh, test, you know, uh, pre-existing theory that somebody else came up with and you're building technical artifacts and tools and so on, even then you've got to have a theory that would sort of explain how, you know, those tools might have effects and, and on whom and on and what conditions. Um, and you should, all, you should think of testing theory, not testing the tools you've built. Meaning, you know, you should test these more fundamental underlying principles that would then transfer to other tools that share the same characteristics to the ones you've built, you know, rather than the specific instances of the tools that you've built. Uh, all right, so that's it for now. Thanks for, for coming uh, and I'll follow up with more stuff over email.